Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss half of the axial skeleton, and really the bulk of this is really just the skull. There's a lot of different bones in the skull. It's deceivingly complex. We're going to break it down in this video using some color-coded skulls from different points of view. So this is a lateral view of the skull. This is actually the right side of a skull, and it's going to be important when you're asked to identify things on a practical to consider the lefts and the rights. A lot of the bones here, or pieces of the bones, are going to have a left and a right. Not all of them, but actually most of these, and so it's going to be very important that you consider that in your answer. And all of these pieces, these bones that are boxed in purple, these are the ones that are going to be important for our class. Okay. First, let's cover the four major cranial bones. Cranial bones are bones that pretty much protect the brain. Okay? There's four of them. We have the frontal bone, the parietal bone, the temporal bone, and the occipital bone. Now, the two that are generally easiest for students to identify are the frontal bone, which is here in yellow in the front, and the occipital bone, which is in brown here. This is how you spell occipital. So the frontal bone is just the bone in the front of the skull on the top. This is one of the four cranial bones. This is one that does not have a left or a right. Okay, It's just one bone. All right, It's the frontal bone. The one in the back in brown, sort of a little bit more inferior but posterior, is the occipital bone. This one also does not have a left or a right. Okay, Now, that being said, these two of the four cranial bones, the frontal and occipital, are easier for students to identify and distinguish between. The two that are kind of confused a lot of times are the parietal bone, which is here in this red color, and the temporal bone, which is here in orange. Um, the parietal bone is always the bone on top. The temporal bone is inferior to the parietal bone. It's on bottom. One way you can remember it is P comes before T in the alphabet, P, Q, R, S, T. So P, parietal, is on top. T, temporal, is on bottom. Now, with the parietal and temporal bones, you do have lefts and rights. Okay, um, Since this is the right side of the skull, if we were asked to identify this part here in red, this would actually be the right parietal bone. Likewise, if we were asked to identify this piece right here, this would be the right temporal bone. This blue bone right here, we see that in part it sort of connects with the frontal bone on top, and then going backwards, it connects with the temporal bone. This blue bone is called the zygomatic bone. Okay, So the zygomatic bone is actually your cheekbone. If you were actually to push on the, uh, the point of your cheek, you'd actually be touching about right here. So the zygomatic bone is your cheekbone. If we extend a little bit further back posteriorly, we see this little strand of bone right here that appears to connect the zygomatic bone with the temporal bone. This stretch of bone right here is called the zygomatic process. And a process is really just any bony extension. It's like a thing that protrudes out. And so this bone, the zygomatic process, uh, extends from the zygomatic bone. And so when you're asked about either of these two, you have to pay close attention to what it's pointing at. If it's this part here that's more anterior, it's just the zygomatic bone. But if it's this strip of bone right here that connects the zygomatic bone to the temporal bone, it's the zygomatic process. Again, both of these have a left and a right. Okay, So these are all the right side. We have a couple other things right here. Um, down here coming below the temporal bone, this very spiky looking thing that shoots downward and a little bit anteriorly, this is called the styloid process. We're also going to have a styloid process when we look at the appendicular skeleton in the radius and the ulna. We'll have styloid processes there as well. But this is the styloid process of the skull. If you move back just inferior to that, this much larger bony extension that comes off of the temporal bone, this is the mastoid process. So the mastoid process is the larger one here, and the styloid process is this very thin looking spike. Okay. Again, both of these have a left and a right. If we look just below the zygomatic process, and kind of in between the zygomatic process, the mastoid process, and the styloid process, we'll see a hole right here. This hole has a fancy name. It's called the external acoustic meatus. What it really is is just your ear hole. 
So if you were to somehow take something like a Q-tip and don't do this, but you were to take that and shove it all the way through your ear canal, it would go through the external acoustic meatus. So this is really just the auditory canal. Okay, this is where sound enters. It's just that you can't obviously see your ear here because we're just looking at the bones. But again, there's one on the left and the right. All right, so the, there's a few other things we'll be able to get a good look at here in this view. Um, up here in this gray color, this is the top part of the jaw um, where your top teeth are connected to. This is the maxilla. Okay, the maxilla um, has some important parts to it as well. First of all, the maxilla has alveolar margins. So alveolar margins or alveoli are really just the roots of each tooth. So if you look at each tooth right above it on the bone of the maxilla, what you'll see is that there's a little ridge. And that ridge is sort of the pocket into which the root of the tooth actually sits and is held. And so each one of these is going to be an alveolus, or collectively they're called alveoli, or alveolar margins. In our textbook, we use the term alveoli, so that is sufficient. So that's the maxilla and then the alveolar margins or alveoli of the maxilla. Then if we look at this bone down here, this is mostly what we consider the jaw, but it's really the, the inferior part of the jaw. This is the mandible or the mandibula. Uh, I'll usually just call it the mandible. This is an orange right here. And the mandible has several parts to it, more than the maxilla. So the mandible has, first of all, alveoli as well, because the mandible also has teeth that go into it. So these ridges down here on the mandible are also alveoli, okay? Also in front here, we have holes. There's one on the right side here. There's another on the left. They're very small. These are called mental foramen. These are the holes that we have inside uh, the mandible. And then there's two processes right here. Well, they're not called both processes, but there are two bony extensions that extend off of the top of the mandible. The one that's more anterior, this is called the coronoid process. Okay. Um, eventually, we're going to see something in the, uh, in the scapula called the coracoid process. So be sure you realize this one that's in the jaw, the mandible, is the coronoid process. And it's the most anterior one. If we go posterior, this one is called the mandibular condyle. It's not technically called a process, but it is a bony extension that sticks upwards. This one is the mandibular condyle. That is always the one that's posterior. Coronoid process, anterior. All right. And there's a few other things that I have here, but we'll actually look at those on the anterior view. So some things here that we haven't seen before. Um, first of all, the nasal bone. Uh, we got a little bit of a look at it here, but we can see it better um, in this image. So from the anterior view, this bone right here is the nasal bone. This one also does technically have a left and a right because these two parts of the nasal bone, the left and the right, develop independently and eventually fuse. So the nasal bone also has a left and a right. Okay. If we look inside the hole of the nose, remember that most of the nose is actually just an empty space. It's only the top of it that actually has bone. This is all interior inside this hole, so to speak. If we look at this part going up, in the back, on top, and you actually have to kind of stick your finger in there to actually touch it, in red here, this is actually called the perpendicular plate. Okay? This is actually part of something called the ethmoid bone. We'll get to that in a minute. But this part here that sticks down in red, and it's actually a little bit farther back into the nose, it's a little deeper, that's the perpendicular plate. This part on the bottom, which is in light blue, this is called the vomer or vomer bone. This actually sticks out a little bit further. It's a little more superficial than the perpendicular plate. And if you were looking at a model, you would much more easily be able to see that. But this is your vomer. Now, here in green on either side, and then also on red on either side, these are called nasal concha. Okay? Um, there's two sets here that we can see. The green ones are the inferior nasal concha. And there's a left one over here and a right one over here. Same thing goes for these ones. These are called the middle nasal concha. Uh, the one on this side is the left middle nasal concha. This one is the right middle nasal concha. Collectively, the middle nasal concha and the perpendicular plate are part of a bone that's called the ethmoid bone. So 
if we look at the nasal bone and go a little bit laterally, we get this green bone, okay? This is called the lacrimal bone. If we go a little bit laterally to that, just adjacent to the lacrimal bone, this orange bone is called the ethmoid bone, okay? So this ethmoid bone, which is on the left and the right side, also constitutes the middle nasal concha and the perpendicular plate. They are part of the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone, we actually won't be able to see too well until we actually open up the top of the skull and look down. Um, but the point is, is we can at least see part of the ethmoid bone right here. If we go uh, through this crack right here, um, we actually are going to see this pink bone, which is called the sphenoid bone. Again, we have it on the right side here and the left. The sphenoid bone is another bone that we'll actually have to pull off the top of the skull and look through a transverse view to be able to see the sphenoid bone a little bit better. Okay. A couple other things which are not going to be tested, but I just want to point them out because they're a little bit interesting. This hole right here in the medial part of the sphenoid bone right here, this is the optic canal. This is actually where the optic nerve will actually go through um, ultimately to the brain. Okay, so there's an optic canal obviously on both left and right. And also down here we have what's called the mandibular symphysis. So a symphysis is basically um, a joint that forms. It's not movable and it fuses two bones together. Um, we're going to see that in the pelvis eventually, where the two halves of the pelvis fuse together in something called the pubic symphysis. But actually, the mandible actually develops as two independent bones. If you looked at a fetal skull, you'd actually see this. And that these two halves of the mandible, the left side and the right side, fuse into something uh, called the mandibular symphysis, and so it will appear as one bone. But technically, in development, there's actually a left and a right side to the mandible. Okay, so in this view, what they've done, as you can see here, is they've basically run a transverse plane through about one-third of the way down the skull, and they've removed the top, and we're looking down, okay? And so I mentioned we'd be able to see the ethmoid bone a little bit better and the sphenoid bone. So the ethmoid bone, in general, is this part right here. And these are two extra parts of the ethmoid bone that we have not seen. Those are the crystagalli and the cribriform plate. The crystagalli, this is a point of confusion, is this middle part right here that kind of sticks up. And if you're actually looking at a model, you'd be able to see that it sticks up relative to this corky part that's on either side of it. But this part in the middle that sticks up, going all the way down where my mouse is, up and down, that is the crystagalli. If you had something pointing to this corky board appearance that's either uh, laterally to the right of this or laterally to the left of the crystagalli, this part on either side is the cribriform plate. So if your, map, if your arrow or pointer was right here, you'd be talking about the crystagalli. However, if it was pointed right here, that would be the cribriform plate. Okay? And the cribriform plate also does have a left and a right. Over here would be the right side, and this would be the left over here. Now, this part in pink, this is the sphenoid bone. Um, the sphenoid bone is a lot easier seen, again, um, when we actually look uh, at this transverse view, looking inferiorly, um, there's two wings of it. I don't expect you to know these, but the lesser wing is the one that's kind of up on top. It's overall smaller, and the greater wing is kind of this one that's a valley right here. Okay, And right in the middle, and this is part of the sphenoid bone, we actually have this little basin right here called the cella tersica. And if you had a model, you could stick your finger right in there and lay your finger in there. This, uh, this valley right here, if you want to call it that, is actually where the pituitary gland will sit. Um, we haven't covered that yet, but that's just a little piece of extra information. But you do need to know the cella tersica and that it's part of the sphenoid bone. Okay. Um, one other thing here that's important to note is we have this giant hole here. And this hole is what's called the foramen magnum. Now this is just going forward because we'll see this again and again. Um, if you see the term magnum or magna or something like that in, phys in anatomy, that usually means large or big. Okay, If you talk about someone's magnum opus, you've probably heard that term, that is their biggest work. So you could probably consider you know, Metallica's magnum opus is Master of Puppets. That's their greatest album they ever made, some people would argue. So magnum means largest or biggest. So a foreman is a whole, 
And so this is the large hole. It is a very large hole, as we can see here. And what we'll eventually see is that the spinal cord actually runs down through that hole. Okay, That's why it has to be so large. But this is the foramen magnum. Now, we're going to take a look at one more view of the skull. In this view, it's an inferior view, and the mandible has been removed, so we can see some extra features here. Okay, So if we look underneath the maxilla, so this pink bone right here is the maxilla. Uh, this part right here that's in kind of this pale green color, that's what's called the palatine bone. And combined, the hard palate um, I don't expect you to know this, but if you ever hear this term, the hard palate is composed of both the maxilla and the palatine bone right here. But the palatine bone is actually um, more posterior, whereas most of the maxilla is more anterior. The palatine bone, or just palatine, is, is posterior to the rest of it. Okay, so that's this bone right there. Again, we can also see the sphenoid bone in this view, okay? Uh, this is the inferior part of the sphenoid bone, and so this would be the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Now, here's our form in magnum, but now we're looking at the other side of it. So actually, the, the brain stem would be sitting inside the skull here, and then the spinal cord would be coming out of the screen toward you looking at the screen. Okay. Now, if we look at the form in magnum, if we go laterally from that, we have these little ridges right here. These are called the occipital condyles, and there's two of them, so again, we have a left and a right occipital condyle. If we're looking at this skull, uh, this part would be the left over here, and this would be the right, okay? And so we have a left and right occipital condyle. If we go a little bit laterally from that, we have the mastoid processes again. Uh, we saw the mastoid processes in this view, okay? Um, in the lateral view, but if we turn the skull upside down, the mastoid processes are these ridges that are going to be just lateral from the adjacent occipital condyle. Okay? We can also see both of the styloid processes, again, that we could see in the lateral view right here. Those are those sharp, pointy spikes on either side of the skull. So here are your styloid processes. Okay? Another thing that we can also see is this little valley right here. We see this term fossa. Fossa normally refers to like a basin-like structure, and a bone will actually sit in the fossa, okay? So the mandibular fossa, again, we have a right one over here and a left one over on this side, and it turns out that the mandibular condyle of the mandible actually sits in the mandibular fossa and forms a joint. And that joint, whenever you open your mouth and your mandible depresses or goes down, you're actually moving the mandible about this joint that's composed of the mandibular condyle sitting in the mandibular fossa. Okay? So this pretty much covers all the major bones that uh, I expect you to know and that this course expects you to know for the skull. Um, there's a few other things I didn't cover in this that we'll cover in a future video that have to do with the fetal skull. We did not cover sutures and we did not cover fontanelles. We will cover those in a separate video. But as for now, in the second video of the axial skeleton, we will discuss the sternum and the rib cage, and then the vertebra, and then uh, the bottom of the vertebra, which is the sacrum and coccyx. So make sure to join us then, and keep a watch for the video on sutures and fontanelles. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.